big things to remember about that pipeline of disinformation we've observed, you know, the one that runs from the halls of the Kremlin all the way to the airwaves of right-wing media here in the United States. First, it predates the Ukraine invasion, and second, it runs both ways. It is a symbiotic relationship whereby each side helps the other develop and then spread mutually beneficial narratives. Think of the feedback loop associated with Russia's entirely fake bioweapons accusations, a lie cooked up in the back corners of English language online media, spread by the Russian government and its state media, then fed back to Americans ready and willing to amplify it. That back and forth relationship is the subject of a New York Times piece today, quote, by reinforcing and feeding each other's messaging, some right-wing Americans have given credibility to Russia's assertions and vice versa. Together, they have created an alternate reality, recasting the Western bloc of allies as provokers, blunderers, and liars, which has bolstered Mr. Putin. Joining our conversation, Dr. Jason Johnson, professor of journalism and politics at Morgan State University and an MSNBC and GRIO contributor, Ben Rhodes, Rick Stengel are still with us. Jason, you've got the so-called America first crowd in lockstep with Kremlin talking points for mutual benefit. Why? Uh, because anything that harms Joe Biden is OK for the American right. You, you got to remember at this point, we're not dealing with people who are looking at the United States in terms of winning hearts and minds and voters. We're talking about a far right that is basically the spokesperson for the ongoing insurrection that is being covered politically by the Republican Party. So anything that makes Joe Biden look weak and, and, and Putin looking strong makes Joe Biden look weak, they're going to support it. But I, Alicia, I also think there's an important thing to understand here. We're seeing this sort of odd horseshoe theory with, with, with some of the rhetoric about Russia and the Ukraine as well, where we're seeing people on the quote unquote far left who are making the same argument, who are claiming, well, the United States is just as bad as Russia, so what Putin's doing is fine. And then you have the far right saying, well, actually, Zelensky is a terrible thug and a criminal. So you see a lot of this online information from the far left and the far right, both basically saying that Vladimir Putin is perfectly OK, that his imperialism is somehow less problematic than American imperialism, and using that to ultimately undermine President Joe Biden, because to them, NATO is a greater threat than what's happening right now in Kiev, where people are being bombed out of their homes for having the audacity of not wanting to live under Putin's rule. But when we talk about the relationship specifically with the far right, as I mentioned, it predates the invasion of Ukraine. In your view, was the 2016 election the dawn of that relationship? And in what other ways has it manifested itself? Well, I think that actually the, this relationship really began to pick up around the 2014 Russian invasion of Ukraine when we saw a real uptick, and Rick and I lived this together in the Obama administration, a real uptick in Russian disinformation campaigns. You know, I talked to Alexei Navalny uh, when I was interviewing for my book in 2020, and the point he made about Russian disinformation, about Putinism generally, is it's not about convincing people that Putin is telling the truth or that he's even a good leader. It's the kind of disinformation that aims to convince people that everybody's corrupt, everybody's in on the tape, uh, that your enemies and your grievances are expressed. Uh, and what we saw is the symbiotic relationship between the American right and Putinism really in that space. So that in the 2016 election, what the Russians did is they looked for pre-existing narratives in American right wing and social media, like Hillary Clinton's corruption or her health, uh, and they just turbocharged those narratives with their own disinformation campaigns. Then you had American right wing narratives about a so-called deep state undermining Donald Trump, things like QAnon that trafficked uh, in allegations of child of pornography and pedophilia, something that also featured in Russian disinformation. It's like the two information ecosystems kind of merged through the 2016 election and into the Trump years, where narratives about corruption, uh, about elites, uh, about uh, deep states, uh, about you know, plots to control uh, the global economy, those were emanating from both Russia and the American right with the same velocity and ferocity. Uh, and now I think we see in Ukraine the most tragic manifestation of where disinformation can lead. It's an entire war built on a pyramid of lies. Unfortunately, the American right wing had gone along with a lot of those lies of the last few years. Remember the conspiracy theories that somehow Ukraine had hacked the 2016 election, not Russia? Obviously, something was picked up by both Russian bots and, and by American right wing trolls. These are the kinds of narratives 
that Putin surfed into this war, and it's left the American right wing in this deeply awkward position where some of them are still willing to go along with it, and some of them are realizing that they've been accomplices to something that leads inexorably to the kind of violence that we're witnessing every single day in Ukraine. Rick, to that point, I want to read you the last two paragraphs of that New York Times story that I mentioned, and then I want to get your reaction. Quote, some Russians have publicly commented on what appears to be common ground with far-right Americans. Last week on the Russian state-backed news program 60 Minutes, which is not connected to the CBS show of the same name, the host, Olga Skabiva, addressed the country's strengthening ties with Mr. Carlson. Quote, our acquaintance, the host of Fox News, Tucker Carlson, obviously has his own interest, she said, airing several clips of Mr. Carlson's show where he suggested the United States had pushed for conflict in Ukraine. But lately, more and more often, they're in tune with our own. Right, Rick, as Ben said, the two of you lived through this together during the Obama administration. How useful is American media to the Russians? Well, what Putin has done, uh, which I wrote about in, in my book about this, is it, he weaponized Russian grievances. And the reason it connects with people in the American right wing is that they have these similar sorts of grievances. I mean, one of the things that I think people don't understand and, and when they were writing about what the Russians did in 2016 and 2020 is this idea that the Russians are super sophisticated, that they have some special sauce to persuade people of things that they don't want to believe. That's false. Disinformation is not a supply problem. It's a demand problem. People want to get it. You know, uh, they're very receptive to it. it. They have confirmation bias and it fulfills the, their need for conspiracy theories. So I actually think that the, that the, the feedback loop of us going to Russia is a lot less important than what Russia is doing here. The Russians are, feel insecure about everything that they do when someone in America agrees with them and says that they're right. I mean, they're happy as can be, and that's all that we see there. But what, we, but what Putin is doing is putting out chum here that people are picking up on. And, and the, uh, the whole rationale for the war, Ukraine is not a country. Ukraine should be part of Russia, which is a false rationale, is something that has been picked up by the American right, and that is tragic. Ben Rhodes, Rick Stengel, thank you both so much for getting us started. Jason, you are sticking with me. I'm going to see you on the other side of this conversation because as we have been reporting, President Biden is in Brussels tonight ahead of his meeting tomorrow with European allies as they prepare to show a united front against Russia and Russian President Vladimir Putin. The president huddling with allies and is expected to announce new sanctions. NBC News also reporting today that the United States plans to permanently maintain an increased number of its troops deployed in NATO countries near Ukraine. Joining us now, Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer. Thank you so much for being with us. As we just said, the president expecting to leave troops in NATO countries. NATO countries hope to agree to bolster troops around Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia. Is the president considering additional troops and where would they go? Well, uh, thank you for having me. I don't want to get ahead of the president, but what I will say is you are going to see on display uh, tomorrow and over the coming days, all, days, all three core elements of our strategy uh, in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. First and foremost, obviously, the pressure that we have been able to, to muster uh, in full alignment with our partners and allies on Russia in terms of uh, economic sanctions that have uh, really done a lot of damage to the Russian economy and are going to continue to do so. Second, the assistance that we are flowing uh, together into Ukraine to strengthen its hand on the battlefield. And third, uh, what you were just mentioning, which is uh, NATO force posture, increasing uh, the number of, of troops uh, on NATO's eastern flank to reassure our partners and allies uh, in the face of, of this Russian uh, aggression. Uh, all of this has been uh, fully consultative, fully unified with partners and allies. You're going to see the president on the world stage uh, making all of those points in the coming days. Let's talk about the first point that you raised, sanctions. It's been reported the president is looking to shore up new sanctions from allies while in Brussels. The AP reporting, quote, one new sanctions option that Biden is looking at is to target hundreds of members of the Russian state Duma, the lower house parliament. According to a U.S. official who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss the move ahead of any announcement. John, what new sanctions can we expect? 
Well, look, uh, again, you, you have very enterprising uh, journalists here, but I'm not going to uh, either confirm those reports or, or make new announcements on this program. I will uh, uh, tell you that you should expect to hear from the president and from our uh, European allies uh, tomorrow additional sanction steps, additional pressure on top of, of the significant steps that have already been taken uh, that have really done significant damage uh, to the strength of, of Russia's ruble, uh, to its stock market. Uh, you've seen an outflow of, of Russian uh, professionals and technical experts uh, out of the country uh, in light of, of really what are diminished future prospects in the near term, at least, for Russia's uh, economy as a result of these steps, which I think were largely unexpected in terms of their strength and severity uh, by the Russians, despite the fact that we said for, for, for quite some time that this was coming if they made the mistake of invading Ukraine. And we are going to need to stay on top of that uh, over the uh, days and weeks to come. John, one of the lingering worries for the West has been Russia possibly using chemical weapons against Ukrainians. President Biden addressed it this morning before taking off from the South Lawn. Take a listen. How about the threat of chemical warfare right now that Russia is using chemical weapons? How high is that threat? I think it's a real threat. Thank you. A real threat. How concerned is the administration, John, and the West about the possibility of chemical weapons? And how does the strategy change if they are, in fact, deployed? So this is obviously one of the scenarios uh, about which we are very concerned, uh, in part because uh, Russia has uh, struggled on the uh, battlefield. We don't think this conflict has gone according to their plan. It's been slower. Uh, they have taken more casualties than we believe uh, that they expected. And so one of the concerns about that uh, is that they could choose uh, to escalate, including uh, choosing to escalate by using chemical weapons. The other reason that we're concerned about them taking that step is Russia is following uh, what unfortunately is a, a playbook that they have used over time of making accusations about the other side about something that they intend to do. So you've heard these Russian uh, claims that the Ukrainians, uh, or maybe even the Ukrainians working uh, with the United States, uh, might be uh, contemplating using chemical or biological weapons. I can tell you definitively that is total nonsense. The Ukrainians do not have these weapons. Uh, but the fact that Russia is talking about this is a play that they sometimes run when they are intending to go down that path themselves. And so we have tried to be unequivocal uh, about what a mistake uh, that would be for Russia uh, to make. And the president has said there would be uh, severe consequences if they go down that road. We're not going to spell all that out uh, in advance, uh, but, but it would be significant. John, understanding that tomorrow there are going to be conversations and those conversations will be whatever they will be, I am sure that there is some anticipation on your side of what the greatest obstacle, what the greatest sticking point is going to be in those conversations. Uh, look, you know, to be honest, I, I think the, the greatest accomplishment up, up till now uh, that the West has shown in the face of, of really what is an outrageous act uh, by Russia that they continue to perpetrate day in, day out, which is this totally unnecessary, uh, totally brutal uh, conflict, which rises to the level of, of war crimes, as our State Department uh, said definitively today, is that the West has remained uh, resolved, that our allies have held together. Uh, you know, I think President Putin had some objectives in this conflict. One was success on the battlefield. He is struggling uh, there. He also, I think, thought that he could divide uh, the West internally, that some countries might be more cautious uh, about, about sanctioning uh, Russia, about providing assistance to the Ukrainians, about increasing uh, forces on, on Russia's border. And in fact, what he has found is exactly the opposite. He has brought about a much higher degree of unity than I think he, we have seen in recent years and then that he expected. You know, and third, I think he expected to enhance Russian power and, and prestige by doing this. Uh, and, and he's had the exact opposite effect, just given the state of their economy, the state of this conflict. And, and one thing I will caution, though, is this is going to be a long effort. This is going to need to take place over weeks uh, and months and potentially even longer. And so the unity that, that is on display now, uh, the real work is going to be maintaining that over time. I take that note of caution. Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer, thank you so much for spending some time with us. When we return, day two of questioning for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. And with her confirmation all but assured, Republicans are using their time in the spotlight to air their own grievances.